For many Americans, the moon landing in the summer of 1969 is our pinnacle national achievement. It was the end of the space race, a major milestone in the Cold War against the Soviet Union, and a testament to human ingenuity and perseverance. And while much attention is given to the astronauts and pilots who braved into the great unknown, there was another odyssey going on behind the scenes in the 1960s. Before you can land a man on the moon, you have to know where on the moon you're going to land, and what that surface is made of. A small group of planetary scientists, outcasts for much of the 1950s, were enlisted by NASA to answer these questions and pave the way for lunar exploration. Now it is time to take longer strides, time for a great new American enterprise. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. For much of the 1950s, astronomers and scientists weren't very interested in the moon. If anything, it was a nuisance, a bright, shining light which made it difficult to spot distant galaxies and nebula. At an IAU conference in the mid-50s, Dr. Gerard Kuiper, an eccentric Dutch-American scientist, sent out a memo asking his fellow astronomers for assistance in creating a comprehensive map of the lunar surface. Only one person responded. My name is Ewan Whitaker. I've had the privilege of working longer for Dr. Kuiper than any other person. Ewan Whitaker, a calm and collected Englishman with an interest in the moon and its mysteries. Whitaker met Kuiper briefly at that IAU conference and was invited to work with him at Yerkes Observatory in Chicago. Even at their first meeting, Kuiper's eccentric and curmudgeonly nature shined through. In 1957, I arrived at uh, O'Hare Airport at Chicago. He was there to meet me. We went out to the carport, we went up and down the aisles, and he could not remember for the life of him where he'd parked this car. And he said, well, it should be easy enough to see. It's a shocking pink color, a large Oldsmobile. How the dickens could you lose such a huge car and be of that beautiful pink color? Went a lot of work. We had to collect all these many, many prints of the moon together in an attempt to make a, the most accurate map of the moon ever made. At the dawn of the 1960s, Kuiper received an invitation to set up a new center for study in Tucson, Arizona. With much better conditions for observing the planets and a much more lenient attitude towards Kuiper's working methods, he took up their offer and headed out west. And this was quite a large move. It involved uh, a large amount of material had to be moved, of course, including a very large lunar globe. Kuiper, Whitaker, and a small circle of scientists established the Lunar and Planetary Lab at the University of Arizona. Being one of the only places in America devoted to the study of the planets, it became a hub for lunar research. In the early 60s, the world was changing quickly. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. I do not regard the first man in space as a sign of the weakening of the free world. These atlases were quite impressive, and apparently they impressed NASA. They came to Dr. Kuiper for assistance, and the first of the NASA projects was the Ranger series. The Ranger program, ran out of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, had a straightforward mission, to use television cameras attached to a probe to take the best photos of the lunar surface ever created. After taking these photos and sending them back, Ranger would impact into the lunar surface. Dr. Kuiper was asked by NASA to participate in this series as an advisor right from its outset. Seventeen seconds and counting, guidance internal. Fifteen, fourteen, thirteen, twelve, eleven, ten, nine. We have ignition sequence start. Engines on five, four, three, two. All engines running. Launch commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff 49 minutes past the hour. 
Stafford reports the clock has started. Ranger the 1, Ranger 2 were uh, just dummies, really. By now, the space race was well underway. Pressure was rising for the program, now having cost billions of taxpayer dollars. Astronauts were getting prepped for a mission to a place we still didn't really understand. Uh, Rangers 3, 4, and 5 were unsuccessful for one reason or another. As the budget began to skyrocket, NASA had to go with new options. First two blocks of Ranger missions, Rangers 1 through 5, were anything but successful. In 1964, Kuiper was made the principal investigator of the Ranger Block 3 missions which contained a more sophisticated television camera than the previous ones. Ranger 6 was also not successful. It made it to the moon correctly, but gave no video signal back to Earth. It did nothing to help quell the growing national dissatisfaction with the project. The program, now having cost over $42 billion in today's dollars, faced a congressional investigation and audit. The success of Ranger 7 was incredibly vital. And in July of 1964, Kuiper, JPL, and the entire Ranger team would be put to the ultimate test. Ranger 7 approached the moon, the big question in the air was whether the TV cameras would power on and give the necessary signal to capture the photos. We are five seconds from full power. Video is very strong. Video is very clean. This is Goldstone TV control. Ten seconds to impact. Video still good. Excellent signal strength. Three, two, one. The mission was a complete success. The cameras took hundreds of photos of the moon, and Ranger impacted exactly as planned. Uh, this is a great day for science, and this is a great day for the United States. What has been achieved today is uh, truly remarkable. We have made progress in resolution of lunar detail, not by a factor 10, nor by a factor 100, but by a factor of 1,000. Though there were more Ranger missions, Ranger 7 was a big moment in the history of the space race. After early Soviet victories, the tide was slowly beginning to turn in favor of the United States. By 1969, America was a very different place. This uh, Vietnam is our first TV war, and uh, uh, people are finding it are not too much to their liking. For one brief weekend in July of 1969, President Kennedy's dream of lunar exploration came true. Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon on this July 20th, 1969. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I think that was Neil's quote. I didn't understand it. <laughs> no, one small step for man, but I didn't get the second phrase. Well, let's give them just a few little personal glimpses uh, that I've had over the years, but uh, I think that'll do for now. And so I'm going to end this tape right here. <laughs> <laughs>